to begin with, maybe it's just a, John already mentioned the organization. Uh, I will not go into a detailed presentation, but I think it's an important framing for you to understand also the example. So CMI is an independent uh, Finnish organization that works towards conflict prevention and conflict resolution through dialogue and mediation. As mentioned, founded by President Marti Ahtisaari in year 2000, CM has grown a lot over the past two decades and is really now considered to be one of the leaders, um, leading organization, independent organizations in this thematic. Uh, we now have uh, over 150 staff working in around 20 contexts around the world. When it comes to the theme digital peacemaking, we've also uh, really kind of jumped to the train quite early on. Uh, we have an established um, strategic priority on the matter and a department that really looks at how we can make use some of the opportunities provided by digital approaches, but also very mindful of the risks presented to peacemakers. Uh, and frankly, I mean, it is a, it's when it comes to our fields, it's it's very, very early days, I would see for this. I mean, it's a mediation is con considered to be a very and is a very human centered endeavor. Uh, just last week, we had a number of our peers, uh, something called Cyber Mediation Network that CMI was uh, partly founding, um, who are working and have an established interest on this thematic. And we just collective conclusion was that we really it's still kind of use cases are few and far in between. <laughs> There's now a, a lot of talk and perhaps a bit of a hype, but what is actually applied uh, hardly exists. Uh, so that's, I think, important framing as well um, to this. When it comes to the research, um, I mean, there is, as noted also yesterday, there's an increasing interest in data-driven and particularly the use of AI um, approaches in the pursuit of future-oriented peace support measures particularly focused on prediction, forecasting and scenario planning. So the idea is that with digital ICTs, we can um, have a more sincere engagement with conflict by having better data um, and that we have a better representation of the world and the conflict and therefore, therefore we have more effective conflict resolution. And our approach is slightly different um, that we say that just adding more data doesn't really uh, help or to resolve conflict. It's an important aspect for it, but doesn't kind of is not fully um, It doesn't provide the full picture so that while these data driven methods have a scientific appeal um, They have their limitations as well And I think in our kind of work we are starting from the conviction that that Challenges to conflict resolution are not only related to kind of lack of objective knowledge about the causes and drivers of conflict, but also about conflicting values, uh, about conflicting narratives and beliefs, and those need to be brought into the conversation. Uh, also, that as we just talked about the importance of past, but in, me in mediation, there's a really equally important aspect of the future to really start talking about the future collectively envision shared futures and kind of draw on uh, a kind of workable program building on that shared vision. So just uh, when it comes to the framing, you could kind of put it in this way in terms of, as Andreas put it in the article, is like we a lot of talk about sincere technological affordances that help us to analyze, explain the world with as much precision and clarity as possible. But then there's also these kind of subjunctive technology affordances that work primarily in non-cognitive ways. That they seek about amb ambiguous, uh, ambiguity, openness, experimentation, and, and they explore us to um, experience the world as it could be. So not only the world as it is, but also the world as it could be. So let's look at this quite practically. How does this work out? So I'm just going to give you a schematic example of uh, of the work that CMI has done. Uh, so it is, it's about a methodology where we use a digital platform called Inclus. Uh, it's a tool, it's quite simplistic. Uh, frankly, my colleague calls it more like a, a survey monkey on steroids. It's not too complicated, uh, but basically a platform where, um, that helps us participatory analysis and participatory assessment. So the process pretty much has five, ste five steps. First, we have a group of stakeholders, uh, often done in the room, but this is a, a step that could be done also with a more broad-based, where you have 
uh, inputs that identify issues. Issues is used in a fairly loose term, anything that is relevant for addressing of the conflict. Um, so that also kind of give, makes a rather open-ended conversation, uh, open conversation. Um, often we use also the PESTEL framework that is from risk analysis, so they look at, encourage um, stakeholders to look at different political, economic, social, technological, legal aspects, environmental factors that are important to understand the conflict dynamics. Um, and of course this happens with facilitation, um, so that there's kind of a collective, comprehensive consideration of various stakeholders' perspectives. And with the tool, they're just kind of basically visualized and mapped out. You don't need to necessarily see the details, uh, and actually these are illustrative examples, kind of based on real scenarios, but not, not the, uh, kind of a, the concrete scenario as such. And then so the number of issues are kind of put on the project, projected, first identified, and then they are um, analyzed in terms of using kind of a Likert scale, where you could have, let's say, important to the resolution of the conflict. Um, what, how well, how important is this issue for the resolution of the conflict? Or and then to some extent, for example, how well it has been addressed in previous conflict resolution efforts. Mm -hmm. So they identify first the issues and list them, but then also kind of assess them according to these criteria. Criteria could be different. Sometimes we use political feasibility, uh, can use urgency, how urgent in terms of time factor they are. Um, and then also they're mapped out. And of course, these, these um, uh, issues here are kind of the aggregate uh, mean of all the different inputs. But by pushing, for example, one, you could see that what are the, what's the variance within. So here on the right scale, you see it's the war economy and you see the individual inputs. And when people are putting in, they, of course, jointly agreed, but often we also use that they self-identify whether they're representing a government official, civil society actor. So you can also, it's quite transparent, uh, anonymous in one way. So you can separate the person from the position, but at the same time, very transparent and puts all the positions. It's very clear what the party's positions are, uh, where they stand on the scale, but also importantly helps to kind of look at some of the joint priorities. Of course, the issues that are kind of there at the end towards have not been addressed before, but are extremely important for the future addressing of the conflict, very organically kind of starts directing the collective attention to those aspects. Um, we've also often a step that is used is a cross impact analysis, uh, where they look at the relationships between the different conflict issues. So kind of understanding what, what is an effect and what is more of a driver. Um, and that's, this is also a schematic example of that, where they kind of look at the relationships, what, what are the key issues that are driving many others, which, what are the aspects that are more of a consequences. Um, often when it comes to the cross-impact analysis, people find that rather confusing. <laughs> They're like, oh, there's arrows going left and there's arrows going right. But then but what's important here is that this is never the end of the conversation. This is the start of the con conversation and that's the utility of it. Because in that dialogue setting, you can start picking out some of the issues and for many, as they have commented, is also a reframing these issues in a slightly different way. And that's what's important. Also looking towards a more, kind of more future or oriented action. Uh, then if, it, if it's just kind of putting it together, you have the issue identification, you have a joint assessment, they are visualized, uh, discussed, you have, there's a kind of interpretation, some conclusions that are drawn, perhaps identifying some shared priorities, and importantly that works as a basis for more scenario planning that can then can you can work backwards looking at okay what can be collectively done, start moving ahead some of these individual uh, factors. So that's, um, so the, it's kind of like those envisioned futures, they provide a very important basis for collective action. So important here is that these kind of future-oriented dialogues, they don't aim to assess the conflict with scientific accuracy. They're very much about participatory engagement through joint analysis and joint reflection. Uh, but they help to explore those species in those subjective positions and start to look at something that we can be used to reimagine and co-create alternative futures. Um, some, so the value added, so just uh, some uh, comments from colleagues. I mean, first, 
from a facilitator's point of view, and this also links to the changing field of mediation, where you have this really important realization about needing to be more inclusive. So you have more actors and more stakeholders you need to include, and you have e extremely co in complex conflict. So when you have multiple issues, you have multiple parties, and you have multiple perspectives, it often becomes quite difficult to handle. And this is not to completely to simplify to a very complex reality, but make it more manageable as well, to identify some aspects that could be worked together. Um, from a stakeholder's point of view, it's also important in a way they appreciated the value of that it's not only about what the opinions were, but kind of really very concretely seeing what are those aspects where the positions are closer that could be worked on together. And I could not highlight enough that this is that these, uh, the use of this tool has never been about the final outcomes, producing the outcomes of the dialogue, but rather than the starting points for dialogue. What are the issues we want to focus on? Uh, what, are the, what is the ground that we're building on? So if I would highlight a couple of value added for us that we've seen. Firstly, is this visualization that is very helpful for transparency of the dialogue. Also put stakeholders on rather equal footing. So you, you, know, you have kind of, if I think about women, peace and security perspective, you do have this like a power balances in the room that really prevent certain um, points of views to being heard. But there they are, they are visualized on the table. You can't ignore them, they're all on the same footing. It is also about this separating the person from the problem. So you look in the, the jointly, very practically uh, looking at the issues together. Uh, there's of course this efficiency aspect that you just are able to manage uh, a great deal of data, particularly if you collect it on a more kind of participatory basis. Um, it's also the tool, as I said, is quite simple. And in many ways that is easier to bring into this very human centered endeavor because it's easier to trust. People see very directly kind of their inputs and how they're reflected rather than that being you know, fed into a system that then kind of produces outcomes that are kind of uh, distanced. Um, so we find that these are, these are kind of, it's one way where the subjunctive affordance, they provide a very important supplementary task that they establish views and reframe perspectives, not only by producing more evidence, but through this joint data interpretation and visualizations that can change how stakeholders themselves relate to the conflict and understand their conflict. Um, and also, of course, a very important limitation linked to kind of CMI's role. I mean, CMI as an informal actor, we are often one of actors that we, an, we are not the one who is kind of in charge of the formal process that we would need to bring about a comprehensive and lasting political settlement alone, but are rather a complementary uh, forum and an actor conven convene dialogues to provide and move forward political momentum, uh, help to identify issues that need to be addressed. So that's also an important kind of uh, caveat to the role. So, uh, but what we found, this kind of very simple tool is quite useful. Um, and we really, I think that, that example just highlights often the mediators talk about the misuse of technology. And frankly, we think we should talk more about missed use of technology. Uh, because there's quite a bit of potential when done with care that we could draw upon. So thank you very much.